Hello everyone and welcome to this session on DPOs, when do you need to appoint one? My name is Noria Pastor and I'm, I am a director at Phil Fisher's Privacy, Security and Information Law Team in London. And today I'm joined by my colleagues Camille Ebden and Hannah Wallet. This is part of Phil Fisher's Get Data Protection Feed series. In module one, we have looked at the fundamentals of data protection law. Then in module 2A, we looked at putting data protection into practice. And now we are at module 2B. And this section covers segment four, DPOs. When do you need to appoint one? All our previous modules are available on our YouTube channel. So, what are the learning outcomes for this session? By the end of this session, you should be able to know when you have to appoint a DPO under the GDPR, understand the role of a DPO, understand how and where to appoint a DPO, and understand an organization's obligations to their DPO. So, what is the structure of this session going to be? Well, we will look at these topics. We will look at the appointment of a DPO and the mandatory test for, GD for DPO appointment under the GDPR. We we'll look at the tasks of the DPO, at who can be your DPO, or where can your DPO be located. We will also look at your organization's obligations towards your DPO. And finally, we will look at the risks and liabilities under the GDPR. So we'll now move on to our first topic, which is appointing a DPO. Appointing a DPO is a requirement under, under certain circumstances under the GDPR, but it can also be a requirement under member state law and under the data protection laws of third countries. So you, you are required under the, under the GDPR to appoint a DPO if one of the three following scenarios apply. So where your organization is a public authority, where your organization's core activities involve monitoring individuals regularly and systematically and on a large scale, or where your organization's core activities involve processing a special category data or criminal convictions data on a large scale. As I said earlier, you can be required to appoint a DPO under EU member state law. This is the case, for example, in Germany. In Germany, companies that have at least 10 employees who are permanently engaged in the automated processing of personal data must appoint a DPO. A DPO is also required in Germany if your organization processes personal data that is subject to a DPIA under Article 35 of the GDPR, as well as in certain industries like market research and consumer, consumer scoring. Thirdly, Appointing a DPO can also be required or considered best practice in countries who are not member states of the European Union. These are requirements, um, this is a requirement, for example, in Russia and Canada. I will now hand over to my colleague, Hannah, who is going to take us through in more detail when a DPO is required under the GDPR. Thank you, Nuria. In this slide, we are going to take a deeper look at the two instances where a DPO is required under the GDPR by organisations that are not public bodies. A lot of the terminology the GDPR uses when it sets out these two instances is not defined in the GDPR. However, the European Data Protection Board, the EDPB, has provided some guidance on how to interpret these terms. The EDPB's role is to act as an overarching supervisory body for data protection in the EEA. So, 
looking at the first instance where a DPO is required under the GDPR. What does core activities mean? The EDPB says these are the key operations which are necessary for a business to achieve its goals. These activities must not be ancillary, for example payroll, and must form an inextricable part of a business's activity. For example, processing patients' health data is an inextricable part of a hospital's business. What about regular and systematic monitoring? The EDPB say regular means ongoing or occurring at intervals, repeated at fixed times and or constantly taking place. They say systematic means occurring according to a system and or carried out as part of a strategy. The term monitoring is interpreted as any form of tracking and profiling on the internet, but also applies to offline activities such as loyalty schemes. The final component is large scale. And whilst the EDPB guidance does not quantify an amount that constitutes large scale, it does provide a list of factors which should be considered, which are number of data subjects, volume of data, duration and extent of the processing. So, looking at the second instance where a DPO is required under the GDPR, the same interpretations apply regarding core activities and large scale. Special categories of data are defined in Article 9 of the GDPR and include personal data regarding health, ethnicity, sex life, religion, etc. Organisations are expected to carry out an assessment to determine whether their processing activities fall in scope of either of these and therefore whether they need to appoint a DPO. Sometimes organisations are not mandated to appoint a DPO but they choose to do so anyway. Whilst this sounds like a good compliance step, bear in mind that your organisation will still then need to meet certain GDPR requirements where there is a DPO. DPO tasks. Article 39 of the GDPR sets out certain tasks that a DPO is required to carry out, including advising the organisation on their obligations under the GDPR, monitoring compliance with the GDPR and other member state laws, monitoring compliance with relevant data protection policies. This includes staff training, raising awareness, assigning responsibilities to staff and carrying out audits, advising the organisation on the need to carry out a data protection impact assessment and monitoring performance to assess whether the processing carried out is in line with the DPIA, particularly where there is a change in risk and cooperating with the supervisor authority and being the contact point for the organisation with respect to communications with the supervisory authority. So, who can be a DPO? Article 37 of the GDPR states that the DPO must be designated on the basis of professional qualities and, in particular, expert knowledge of data protection law and practices. The GDPR does not further specify what the professional qualities of the DPO should be, but the EDPB interprets this to mean that a DPO must have expertise in national and European data protection laws and practices and an in-depth understanding of the GDPR. The DPO can be an employee of the company or a third party. If an employee, they can perform the DPO role full or part-time, depending on the size of the organisation and the circumstances. External DPOs can be set up as a team with one individual as a lead contact. Although not specified by the GDPR, it makes sense that a DPO should also have good knowledge and understanding of an organisation's core business activities, business sector and internal operations and IT systems. In our experience, it is also useful for a DPO to have some basic knowledge of the laws that apply to particular business sectors for example, banking, electronic communication, healthcare or life sciences. Be careful if you are planning to appoint an employee who also has another role within the business, which involves making decisions as to the purposes and means of processing personal data. This can be considered a material conflict of interest. In April 2020, the Belgian DPA fined a company €50,000 for appointing a DPO who was also head of compliance, risk and audit. They felt this was a conflicting role. However, this was controversial. 
the EDPB guidance provided other examples of roles that may have a potential conflict. For instance, head of human resources or head of IT departments. Groups of companies may also designate a single DPO at a group level, although it is likely they will need a support team to carry out their tasks. So, where does your DPO need to be located? As explained above, the GDPR allows group companies to designate a single DPO for the whole group. However, this is on the condition that the DPO should still be easily accessible from each establishment of the group. The EDPB interprets this as meaning the DPO must ensure their contact details are published and be in a position to efficiently communicate in the language of the supervisory authority and data subjects concerned. But does a DPO need to be in the EU? In general, the EDPB guidance recommends that the DPO should be located within the EU whether or not an organisation is established in the EU. However, the guidance does state that where the controller or processor has no establishment within the EU, the DPO may be able to carry out his or her activities more effectively if located outside the EU. So in short, although the EDPB clearly has a preference for DPOs to be located in the EU for the purpose of accessibility to data subjects and the data protection authorities, in practice, multinational organisations who have their headquarters outside the EU often appoint a DPO who is not physically established in the EU. A key practical consideration in these cases is that the DPO has a support network of data protection professionals and privacy champions across territories. I'll now hand over to Camille, who will take us through the next section. Thank you, Hannah. Okay, so we are now turning to what is required of an organisation. Article 38 GDPR sets out most of the requirements for controllers and processors regarding data protection officers. Firstly, the GDPR sets out that the organisation must ensure that the DPO is involved properly and in a timely manner in all issues relating to, to personal data protection. With that in mind, the DPO should be invited to participate in regular meetings and to be present when decisions are taken which have data protection implications. Information regarding personal data issues should be passed to the DPO in a timely manner and the DPO should be consulted promptly upon the discovery of a data breach or incident. Secondly, the GDPR requires that an organisation must provide all resources that are necessary for DPOs to carry out their role and maintain their expert knowledge. For example, all necessary facilities and training. Thirdly, the organisation should not give the DPO any instructions regarding the exercise of their tasks. And this is to ensure the independence of the DPO. Fourthly, DPO should not be penalised or punished for performing their tasks or dismissed. An organisation must ensure that the DPO has a direct reporting line to the highest management level. And finally, organisations are also required to publish the contact details of the, of the DPO and communicate them to the relevant data protection authority. It's also sensible for the organisation to publicise the role of the DPO internally and ensure staff are aware of the DPO's function within the business. So what happens if you get it wrong? Well, an organisation could be fined up to 10 million euros or 2% of total worldwide annual turnover, whichever is higher, for breach of their DPO obligations. We mentioned earlier a case where a company were fined for appointing a DPO where it was deemed that there was a conflict of interest with another role held by that individual. Organisations have also been fined in the EU for failing to appoint a DPO when they were required to do so under the GDPR. For example, in June this year, the Spanish DPA fined an on-demand courier service €25,000 for failing to appoint a DPO. The Spanish DPA said that this courier company's core activities included regular and systematic monitoring of data subjects on a large scale 
and therefore they met the threshold for the mandatory appointment of a DPO and should have appointed one. Organisations can also be fined for failing to notify the appointment of a DPO to the relevant data protection authorities. For example, in December 2019, the Hamburg DPA imposed a fine of €51,000 on Facebook's German subsidiary for failing to notify the appointment of its DPO to German data protection authorities. And what about the DPO themselves? Well, generally DPO obligations are imposed on the organisation and not directly on the DPO. In terms of any ind individual appointed as a DPO, there is no personal liability. However, there could be a breach of negligence or a breach of statutory duty. We're now drawing to the end of this session. And just to recap, you should now be equipped to know when you have to appoint a DPO under the GDPR, understand the role of a DPO, understand how and where to appoint a DPO, and understand an organization's obligations to their DPO.